Welcome back. Uh, if you haven't seen the, at least the first video in this series on the protection of Christ, I'd encourage you to watch that. It shows the scripture from uh, Genesis all the way through to Revelation. So you'll see that this is not just my idea, but I believe this is what scripture really teaches as one of the P's of the gospel introduced in Genesis 1. So how can we use this information to help uh, non-believers or people who are really struggling in a young faith? Let's take a look at some specific examples. For one, we need to talk to them about the spiritual threats, and those are the flesh, the world, and Satan himself. If you think back to the first 11 chapters of, of Genesis, this is pretty easy to see. Who was the snake or the serpent in the garden? It was a representation of Satan himself. He is the tempter uh, most originally. But then they were tempted in their flesh, not just uh, physical things, but the flesh meaning the appeal to satisfy ourselves or the appeal uh, and desire to um, indulge ourselves as opposed to what God by His Spirit calls us to do to trust and follow Him. Uh, they saw the, the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil and rather than trust in God to decide what's good, and to follow him and learn through a relationship of, of what is good, the absence of which is evil or, or what contradicts it is evil. They wanted it immediately, independent of God. Uh, we see, too, that in uh, Seth's line to the seventh generation, there is Enoch who put their trust in God, says they were described as crying out to the Lord and calling on his name. And the seventh generation, the perfection of that is that he walked with God and didn't even die. He just was no more. He was taken directly into heaven. The seventh on uh, Cain's side, however, those that tried to build a name for themselves, and we can see that in Genesis 4, uh, that seventh guy was Lemek, who was so entitled, he felt like he could commit murder, and God owed him forgiveness. So uh, that is the appeal of the flesh, and it goes all the way to uh, Genesis chapter, um, wherever the Tower of Babel is. It's, it's right there. Sorry. <laughs> Can't keep it all in here. Uh, chapter 11, I believe, uh, where they want to gather together and make a name for themselves, whereas God said to spread out and make a name for Him. That's the appeal of the world. Uh, a mindset all over that you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours and we will help each other and, and ignore each other's sins or applaud each other's sins as long as we can get what we want uh, and elevate ourselves so that there is not a need for God himself. We can even uh, kill God as Nietzsche said we had done, uh, the idea of God. So Satan, the flesh, and the world is what we need protection from. Uh, physical dangers, yes, but not primarily. And the Lord is the one who can and does protect his people for their journey of Holy Communion with him to follow him by faith. We need to also tell them how only Jesus can protect us by his grace and power. The power they probably get, the grace they might not get immediately. They might not even get the power. Uh, and it can be helpful to point to scriptures like the uh, Jeremiah 17 that says the Ethiopian can't change his color and the, the leopard can't change his spots. If I am a sinner, if I enjoy sinning, I'm going to sin. I, I've often told somebody, I love anchovies, but if you don't, you'd have to have a tongue transplant to like anchovies. Uh, the Lord has to have his power to recreate in us his, his spirit or to give us new birth of a new heart. That's his power that we can't do ourselves. It's not about education. It's not about accumulating a certain amount of physical protection or winning friends. Uh, only he can recreate us, and he, can, he only does that and only can do that by his grace. It's undeserved. So we need the Lord Jesus to protect us because he has power over what we can't control or change. And he has love for things, uh, or he has love for us, even when we're undeserving by his grace. God's redemption at Christ's expense, or God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, grace is what we need. We need to talk with them about why he protects us to live pure, changed lives. 
Again, it's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. The Lord doesn't protect us so that we can abuse others or have our own way or climb to the top of the ladder of success on other people's heads. He protects us from spiritual dangers so that we can follow Him spiritually, so we can be new people. But again, we need Him to do that. To talk with them about how Jesus is our wisdom and He protects us by His Word. Not a one-time change in us, a drawing out of sin, but a continual relationship of protection by His Word. Learning who He is in His Scriptures. Learning His commands so we will see. God says, don't do that. Don't do that. Do this instead. If you do this, I'll bless you in this way. If you do that, I will discipline you. Uh, just like we would spend relationship time with a parent or a teacher in school or a mentor in our job. By that relationship time, uh, over uh, years, we grow in our trust of the people because we see that their word, their wisdom, protects us from, from genuine harm. We need to talk with them about the goodness of crying out to God for protection. Especially in cultures that emphasize strength as opposed to humility, or uh, emphasize success as opposed to uh, interchange, uh, asking for help is seen as a weakness. So especially in our culture, we may need to talk with them about how it's not weakness, it's wisdom to ask for help. And we've all done it. Uh, if you've never asked for help, you've either never come upon a task too difficult for you, and you're really going to be crushed and surprised when it finally does come, or you're in misery right now because you won't reach out for somebody to give you a hand, uh, somebody to give you some advice, somebody to, to help you in some other ways. It is wisdom to ask for help and protection when we need it, but we might have talked with them about that. Uh, there's a story about a guy who sent out his son into the field to move this big rock uh, because they needed to hoe the land. And the son said he tried everything. He couldn't get it moved. He dug around it. He tried a stick and a fulcrum. And he, you know, he, he pushed on it. He pulled on it. And he, he said he had tried everything. And the father said, did you try asking me for help? And, of course, the two of them did it together. Uh, it's wisdom, not weakness. We need to talk with them about our continual hopelessness without him. The Lord, uh, although he protects us in the beginning and throughout our walk with him, when we stop looking to the Lord for help, there will be times that he draws his hand back. You can read a story about Hezekiah. It says the Lord removed his hand from Hezekiah so that he would know what's in his heart. I don't think it's talking about God knowing what's in Hezekiah's heart. The Lord knew. Hezekiah needed to know what was in his own heart. And that was when some envoys were coming from another country. Uh, and Hezekiah kind of bragged on all that he had. He showed them all the wealth uh, in his palace and all his possessions. And when one of the prophets came in and says, Hezekiah, what did you do? And he told them, uh, he, he says, you have doomed yourself. Uh, now they're going to come and they're going to take all that is yours. And sure enough, they did. So the Lord withdrew his protection both from Hezekiah's discernment and from his physical property, so that Hezekiah would see again his need to repent and stay close to the Lord. The Lord does that, um, because we are always in the need of growing in our relationship with God and others. We continually need his protection. We must talk with him about the greater goal of his protection, his glory. Again, the Lord doesn't protect us just for the sake of protection as, a, as an end to itself. He wants us to see how wonderful he is. And it's impossible to really enjoy something if our life is riddled with threats and, and other types of dangers. One of the reasons that I tell my uh, kids, all four of them as they were growing up, to keep their room clean is so that when somebody comes to our house, to their room, for a sleepover or just a visit or whatever, they won't be distracted by stepping over things and, and uh, dirty clothes on the floor and sharp toys on the floor they might get hurt on. But they'll, they can enjoy the time. They can uh, play games and spend time together and, and watch some TV and, and, and other stuff. But it's more difficult if they're distracted or even endangered by the room itself. 
The Lord wants us to see His glory and not be distracted or endangered by threats around us. We need to talk with them about the final protection for His people, the new earth. There's a wonderful picture in Genesis, excuse me, Revelation 21 and 22, I forget which, that talks about how thick the walls are, but that the doors are open all the time. Now, why would there need to be thick walls if you're not going to keep your doors shut? It's because there's no need for any protection. There's no dangers anymore. It's a perfectly safe world, but it's a reminder that the Lord is our protection. Uh, he lives there with his people. It's a, it's a great picture it's unnecessary, but God's kind of bragging, look, I am your protection, and I will protect you forever and ever in Christ. And lastly, talk with them about the need for more than Jesus' protection. Now, what does that mean? Isn't Jesus our ultimate protection? Yes, he is. But remember, we just looked at the first half of day three. The second half of day three talks about Jesus as our provision. Not just protecting us from the harm and danger of sin uh, and chaos, but providing the good things that we need for that journey of following him, which we'll see later in day four. And I hope you'll join us next week.